As I record this, the national debt of the United States is $28 trillion, at least according to this website. I'm here to tell you that that's not a problem. This is going to be the first in a series of videos where I discuss a theory of how modern money works called modern money theory. This webisode, do people still say that? Is going to be about government debt. I always love explaining this part. People always seem to get just as big a kick out of it as I did when I first learned it. Consider the entire world economy. Let's look at the grand total value of all the assets in the world and subtract away the total value of all the liabilities in the world. What's an asset and what's a liability? Think of assets as wealth and liabilities as debt. A liability is when you owe someone money and an asset is when money is owed to you. What would you say is the total value of all of the assets in the world minus the value of all the liabilities in the world? Zero dollars. Yep, the total value of all the assets in the world minus the value of all of the liabilities in the world right now is zero dollars. Zero dollars exactly. So should we go running for the hills? Does the world really have that much debt? Oh god, Ron Paul and Bill Cipher were right. I should have bought gold. Reality is an illusion. The universe is a hologram. Buy gold. Buy! No, no, no. Calm down. It's always been the case that the value of all assets minus all liabilities is zero. It's just how it works. But why? Well, let's consider a small loan of a million dollars. The person who takes out the loan has a liability of one million dollars. A liability is when you owe someone something. In this case, it's a million dollars. The person who gave them the loan has an asset worth one million dollars. They are owed one million dollars by whoever took out the loan. Every asset is someone else's liability. Every time someone is owed money, someone else owes money. Assets and liabilities always exist as a pair. But what about all that money in your bank account? Well, that's an asset to you, but a liability to the bank. Anytime, you can choose to go to an ATM or into one of the bank's branches and get an amount of money up to the number that's listed on your account. The bank owes you money, and you are owed money by the bank. Ain't that neat? It's all a zero-sum game. You and a banker are on equal footing before you take out a loan, for example. After you do, the sum of everything in the world is still zero, but now you're inside this hierarchy. How gross, right? Some people even have the audacity to charge your ass for the pleasure of this little sinful exchange. But hold up, Mr. Skellington. You still haven't answered the question. Why does that mean that the government running a deficit is good, actually? $28 trillion? How's that a good thing? And what about all these physical things that have value, like my car and my house and my Adeptus Mechanicus army? How are those someone else's liability? Aren't they just assets to me? Well, I'll first answer the first question first. You may have caught on by now. Why is it good that the government is running a deficit? Well, a deficit means that the government created more liabilities than it did assets. For the government, this means that it spent more than it took in in taxes. The government owing someone else money means that someone else is owed money. But who is this someone? Who does the government owe money to? Us, the private sector. Let me explain. Remember that the total value of all assets and liabilities in the world has to be zero. But what if we cut the world economy up into countries? Within a single country, all the assets and liabilities owned by the people and the businesses and the governments don't have to add up to zero. It's possible, for example, that the people of France owe money to the people of England. But once you remove this foreign part, the rest of it has to add up to zero. Ignoring all the money that's owed overseas and all the money that people overseas owe us, the money that we owe to people within our own country has to add up to zero. We can again cut this remaining part up into the private stuff and the government stuff. Now, if the private sector and the government sector have to add up to zero, then what happens when the government is running a deficit? The private sector runs a surplus. Whenever the government is in debt, that means that the private sector is in surplus. Each year that the government spends more than it makes, the private sector earns more than it spends. Every liability is someone else's asset. And when the government has tons of liabilities, then the private sector has to have tons of assets. Let's go back to that debt clock website. $28 trillion national debt? Flip that frown upside down, man. That's a $28 trillion surplus for the private sector. I can dig. I can dig. See, the national debt is good, actually. Imagine it were the other way around, the government running a surplus. 
Say we start paying down the national debt. Instead of the government running a deficit of $3 trillion every year, it starts running a surplus of $3 trillion a year. That means that the private sector would have to be spending more than it's taking in. So whenever the government runs a surplus, the private sector starts running a deficit. This is bad. It's good when the government runs a deficit. That means the private sector can run a surplus. Any time the federal government chooses to pay down the national debt, it's sucking money away from the private sector. Whoever made this clock website seems to like when money is taken out of the economy and dislikes when money goes in. Keep your BDSM in the bedroom, my guy. Okay, 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 but what about all that stuff I mentioned before about my house and my car? How are those liabilities to someone? Doesn't that break this whole nice relationship that you outlined? And also, you socialist, how can the government pay for its debt if it's always running a deficit? It has to get the money from somewhere. How is the government going to pay for its debt if it's always running a deficit? This is a good question to ask. It comes from a common belief. The United States federal government is broke. Keynesians will tell you that in order to pay off its debt, the federal government needs to raise taxes. Not raise as in make them higher, but raise in the same way you would raise an army. It would be best to line up these taxes with the times when the economy is expanding to prevent it from overheating, and then run deficits during recessions to help the economic recovery. This is a nice idea, and it comes down to probably how you think about your own budgeting. In order to spend money now, you need to have made money in some other point in your life. But there's actually never a reason for a government like the United States or Great Britain or Japan to ever run a surplus. They don't need to to pay for their debt. To understand why the federal government never needs to run a surplus, we need to understand how the federal government pays its debts. And to understand how the federal government pays its debts, we need to first understand what the federal government's debt looks like. It doesn't have a credit card, and it doesn't get loans from banks. All of the debt that the United States government has is in the form of things called treasury bills or treasury bonds. You may also hear them called T-bills or government securities, because anyone in the field of finance wants to make stuff as confusing as humanly possible. Here's how they work. The United States government says, I'll pay you $100 one year from now. How much will you pay me right now for me to do that? And then it holds an auction. A bunch of people come up and it auctions off this promise of paying $100 in one year. It calls this promise a treasury bill. Sometimes it's for one year, sometimes it's for four weeks, sometimes it's 30 years. People at the auction will keep bidding up the price and they'll end up paying less than $100 for this promise. The difference between what they pay and the $100 promise determines the interest rate. This is the form of all of the government's debt. All of it, and all of the money that the United States government owes is in US dollars. That's what it auctioned off, a promise to pay $100 at some point in the future. It doesn't owe any euros or Canadian pesos or anything like that. Now, this might be where I lose some of you. Who creates US dollars? The federal government. And what is all of our debt owed in? US dollars. So could there ever be a time in which a payment for government debt comes due and the US federal government can't come up with the cash. No. To pay the debt that it has, to pay the people who bought the treasury bills, the federal government does not spend tax dollars, and it also doesn't spend the money that it got from selling other treasury bills. It just prints the money to do it. Not literally printing money, of course. It just tells the bank to mark up the account by the appropriate amount of whoever bought the treasury bill. This is actually how the government pays for everything. It just prints money by marking up bank accounts. Unironically, no kappa. So the federal government never has to worry about running a surplus to pay for its debt because it can always, and does always, print money. The United States can pay any debt that it has because it can always print money to do that. So there is zero probability of defaulting or not being able to pay. Don't believe me though. Here is the former chair of the Federal Reserve, the central bank of the United States, Alan Greenspan. Are U.S. Treasury bonds still safe to invest in? Very much so. I think there's a... This is not an issue of credit rating. The United States can pay any debt it has because we can always print money to do that. So there is zero probability of default. 
So the United States can never, ever, forever, never, ever be unable to pay its debt. It also can't ever voluntarily not pay its debt. Section 4 of the 14th Amendment makes it unconstitutional. The validity of the public debt of the United States shall not be questioned. The federal government can't be forced to default, and it can't choose to default. It will always have the money to pay its debt. It makes the money. Okay, okay, but you can't just print money willy-nilly. Inflation is a real thing, and it's bound to happen if this is what the government's doing. And also, you still haven't answered my question about my house and my car and my dakimakras. Well, dear viewer, now we have all of the tools needed to answer your question. The sum of all assets and liabilities equals zero. But what about my house? It has value. It's an asset of mine, so whose liability is it? No one's. Your house is something called a real asset, or a commodity. Mainstream economists will use the term real asset, old school economists will probably use the term commodity. The factoid I gave earlier in the video, in which the sum of all assets and liabilities equals zero, only applies to financial assets, things like loans and bank accounts and money. Commodities, real assets, are things which, through their physical properties, have a use for humans. In our society, commodities are created to be sold. They're sold for money. Just like the amount of steel limits the amount of hammers that can be made, the amount of money can limit the amount of hammers that are made. It takes other people having money to sell them a hammer, and it takes money to buy the labor time and steel to make the hammer in the first place. Money is a resource, like any other. When miners dig iron out of the ground, they increase the supply of iron available to humans. When people turn that iron into steel, they increase the supply of steel to humans. But nothing a business or worker does ever increases the supply of money available. Even though they're adding value at every stage in this process, some governments even tax the value added at each stage in this process, no money is ever being created. The federal government is the only one who is able to create more money, and it needs to do that for the rest of the economy to grow. Whenever there are unused resources, like workers who are unemployed, or mines working below capacity, or factories producing less than their maximum potential output, that means that there is too little money in that section of the economy. Compared to all of the other resources, money is the thing that's limiting output. Whenever there is too much money in a section of the economy, the price of things in that section will begin to rise. The money that was added did not enable the creation of new commodities, so more money competed over the same number of commodities. This is inflation. The exchange value of commodities, the price of real assets as an economist would say, comes from the government creating money. The government is the only place that new money can come from. So the price of your house, and your car, and all of the other weeb shit that you keep in your house, they all started off as just raw materials, and then work was done to them, and it turned them into higher value products. And the only reason that they were able to be sold for that value was that at some point in the past, the government had created the necessary money to do that. It didn't directly give you money to buy your dakimakura, it probably gave someone else money, and that money transferred through the economy and you eventually bought your dakimakura with it. The value in commodities, the value of real assets, comes from the work that was put in to create them. If you buy a plot of land and then build a house on it, the value of that land has gone up. But the exchange value of commodities, the price of real assets, the price of your house, comes from the government creating money to enable someone to purchase it. All of the other stuff sums to zero. The government is the only place that new money can come from. The economy is all about the commodities, the real assets. There is nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to someone. The question is, how do you create a system that ensures that the real assets are created, which those benefits are employed to purchase? There's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. The question is, how do you set up a system which assures that the real assets are created, which those benefits are employed to purchase? As a quick overview, whenever someone does work to a set of materials, they increase the value of that commodity. They increase the value of the real asset. But the only way that someone would be able to purchase that asset is if they took money from somewhere else in the economy, or if the government had created more money to enable it to be purchased. Inflation is a real threat to the economy, make no mistake. 
but it doesn't occur when the government prints money. It could occur when the government prints money, but only if there isn't extra capacity in the economy. The government can always afford anything that it wants to purchase, but it can only print money to buy available resources without risking inflation. Let's use the sports car example to better illustrate this. Right now, there's a certain number of sports cars that are made and sold in the United States. The reason that there's a certain number is because only so many people can afford a sports car, so there's no incentive to add value to the materials that make up the sports car, thus creating a sports car, because no one would be able to purchase it. There's not enough money in the economy somewhere to purchase this new sports car that would be made. If the US federal government wanted to buy every citizen in the country a new Lamborghini, for example, it could afford to do it because it can always come up with the cash. But would there be enough Lamborghinis? Hell no. But say the government goes to Mr. Lambo, I have no idea who runs car companies by the way, and says, how many Lamborghinis can you have completed by this time next year? And then prints enough money to buy just that many. It may even place a ludicrously large order and thus incentivize Mr. Lambo to expand his production. Now the limiting factor in Lamborghini production is the steel and workers available. It will just take a bit of time. Inflation will only happen if this expansion of the money occurs faster than the expansion of the commodities. If these things line up perfectly, then we won't get inflation. Given a certain amount of money in the economy, a certain amount of things are produced and exchanged. When more money is added, that means that there's an opportunity for any stage in this process to expand, depending on where the demand comes from. When there's more demand in an area than supply could match, that's when inflation happens, because there's more money relative to the same number of goods. Just such a thing happened in the Weimar Republic, also known as interwar Germany, during their hyperinflation. They owed commodities to France for war reparations. The people of Germany also needed certain commodities to live. The German government had to fulfill the reparation orders, but also wanted to guarantee a standard of living for its people. It would print as much money as it needed to buy the 100 bushels of wheat this month for the Germans, and also the 100 bushels of wheat that it needed to send to France for this month. But there were only 150 bushels in the whole country. It wasn't the money printing that caused inflation, it was the inability of the economy to expand quickly enough to produce the extra 50 bushels of wheat needed. More money was added, but it competed over the same amount of resources. The economy can become constrained by the amount of money that the government prints, just as it can be constrained by any resource. But there is no reason to let it be constrained by the amount of money that's in circulation, because the government can always create more of it. It's not scarce in the same way as other resources. Imagine going to a movie theater and asking to buy a ticket. The guy behind the counter says, sorry man, we're all out of tickets. And you're like, oh, there are no more seats? They're all filled? And he's like, oh, no, no, no. 3% of the seats aren't filled. We have the seats. We're just out of tickets. And so you're like, well, okay, why can't you just fill those extra seats with people? And the guy replies, uh, we can't afford it. We don't have the tickets. So then why do we need taxes? And why does the government have debt? If we can just print all the money that we need, why bother doing either of those things? First, I'll explain why the government goes into debt. So in real life, the first thing that happens is that the federal government spends money. This money is created from nothing. It pops into existence when the federal government tells banks to mark up bank accounts. Whose bank accounts? Government contractors. Companies Uncle Sam hired to build roads or teach people or build war equipment actually a lot of war equipment. Now, this new money that it created goes into producing commodities. If it pays a teacher, that teacher goes out and buys stuff. If it paid a contractor to build a new interstate highway, then the company goes out and buys materials that it needs, pays its workers, etc. The money moves from the first company's bank account to other companies' bank accounts, and goods and services are exchanged accordingly. This money keeps circulating throughout the economy, enabling the exchange and new production of commodities that otherwise wouldn't exist. After all, there's more money being added to the economy. This keeps happening until someone chooses to invest it in a very specific way. Say you have money and you want to invest it. Companies can fail, so their promise of paying you more money in the future for money now has some risk associated with it. But Uncle Sam always pays his debts, so the investor takes the money and buys a treasury bill. That's all that the US debt is. It's money that was spent in the economy, enabled some exchange along the way, and then got parked into a treasury bill where it essentially died. 
the federal government didn't need to sell the treasury bill to afford to spend, and it didn't need to tax anyone either. There's a set amount of exchanges that are going to happen in the economy, but any time that the government increases the supply of money, more exchanges are typically enabled. Some of those dollars that the government made weren't used to buy things in the United States though. At some point on their journey, they were used to buy things from China. Now the Chinese business people who have these US dollars, they might want to buy stock or real estate with these dollars, but many of them buy treasury bills because of how safe they are. That's what the debt the federal government owes to China is. And these Chinese business people can't come knocking early for their money, and we don't need to rely on them buying our debt in order to enable government spending. The spending happened first, this was just where the money ended up. It being Chinese debt just mean that this dollar floated around the world for a little bit, and the last transaction it made before buying a treasury bill was that it was given to someone in China. If the Chinese business people demanded their money early, and somehow the federal government could be convinced to pay it to them early, all that the federal government would have to do is just print the money and give it to them. This is what it was going to do when the treasury bill matured anyway. So what about taxes? Why do we have taxes if the government can just print money? Great question. But I'm afraid we'll have to save the topic of taxes for the next video in this series. Taxes are really the most important part of money, and without them the whole system would kind of break entirely. Without taxes, we wouldn't even have a market-based economy, which is sure to anger the ant caps in the audience, but uh, whatever. Anytime the government runs a deficit, it means the private sector is running a surplus. Because the federal government of the United States can create the money that it issues its debt in, it can never be unable to pay its debt that it owes. The reason the debt exists is because it is the final stage that the money it spends ends up after it has hopefully enabled the exchange and production of commodities in the economy. When there is too little money in an area of the economy, the area will operate below capacity. When there is too much money in an area, inflation will occur. The cause of inflation is not the amount of money in the economy, it is the lack of capacity for real commodities to be created for that money to purchase. 